Good evening and welcome to Book Passage. I'm Bill Petricelli, one of the owners of the store, and it's my real privilege tonight to be in conversation with one of the giants of, of the publishing and, and journalism world. Uh, and when I tell you all the things that Peter Osnos has done, you'll think one guy couldn't have done all this. Uh, it was a journalist, foreign correspondent, both both a uh, correspondent, correspondent during the Vietnam, Vietnam War, then became a publisher and an editor when I think over the course of the, uh, the years with Random House, edited the books of at least four presidents and God knows how many other famous people, um, then started his own publishing company. Peter has been uh, probably seen every aspect of, of the writing business from one end to the other. And I'm looking forward to asking him all kinds of questions and particularly questions that might be of value to people who are writers themselves are looking about getting a book published because he's seen it all. Um, uh, he, he began, Peter began his uh, career in, in uh, with IF Stone Weekly. That's, if people my age will know immediately who that is. That's one of the, the giants of uh, political literature during the 50s. Uh, he went from there to the Washington Post, became a uh, foreign correspondent for them. Uh, ended up being a correspondent during the, uh, during the Vietnam War, and I want to talk about that as well. Um, but I want to start uh, uh, with uh, asking Peter a little bit about his background. One of the things that motivated him to write this book, this memoir of his career, was uh, to talk about his family and their uh, escape uh, from Poland during the Holocaust, during, right around the time that he was born. Uh, so, Peter, if you want to step in now and we can start talking about that and a few other things. Peter, I'll well, thanks. Thanks very much, Bill. First of all, let me tell you, that there's always uh, we have uh, a daughter and, and her husband and three children in, in Woodacre. And one of the high points of our visits out there is the, is the trips to Book Passage, where I do a little checking out on the shelves to see what <laughs> <laughs> It's a great store and I'm very, very pleased and actually uh, flattered that Bill would want to do this. Uh, this. This story actually starts with what my grandson from Woodacre, uh, Ben Sanford, who as a young teenager asked me once, he said, tell me, they call me Elvis. They don't know that it, they didn't know when I first said it was funny. Now they know it was funny, but I didn't want to be known as poopy. He said, so Elvis, tell me, tell me about your family in World War II. And I said, no, 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 Ben, it's our family. And I realized that the only way he would truly know the story was if I found it, wrote it, discovered exactly in detail what it was, because it was an astonishing story, all of which took place, as it happens, 75 years ago. My folks were in Poland when the war started. They were Poles, Jews. Um, they got out. That's in itself a very dramatic story. Uh, my brother was eight. I was, uh, so he, my brother from eight to 12, lived through the absolute worst of what a child could imagine being through because the Nazis came to Warsaw, the bombs were dropping. My father had to essentially was unable to get back to Warsaw after his military unit disbanded. He finally did succeed in getting my mother and brother out and they eventually made it to India where they arrived in 1940 in the spring. And in the very end of 43, safe, they managed to have a second child. That would be me. <laughs> uh, they left at the very end of 1943 on a troop ship, went across the Pacific, took 40 days. I was in a basket. I arrived in, San, in Los Angeles uh, on February 4th, 1944 in a basket. And the point was that really they had had essentially half their lives before I was born. And so the whole exercise here was, among other things, was to start by rediscovering their lives. So to give you one specific example, I was born in India. I have a, a birth certificate, which I've always been very proud of. It says caste, colon, Polish. Uh, but, the, but, you know, I knew nothing about it. So as it happens, we took these two grandsons, Ben and Peter, went to, uh, to what was Bombay when I was born, Mumbai, and retraced my parents' lives while they were there. And you know, we even found a woman who lived in their apartment building, Auntie Nora, now 99. 
we were able to, in a sense, relive their lives in a way that that made it tangible to me, certainly as someone who was born. I went to the hospital where I was born. I went to my brother's school. I went to the location of where my parents worked. There were all kinds of ways in which it suddenly became what they had accomplished. Arriving in, in Bombay, Mumbai, after this harrowing journey from Poland with nothing but their wits. And then they left in 1943, having made a really very respectable life for themselves and got to New York and started all over again. They were now in their forties. So I wanted to be able to tell that story so that it was preserved. It's not a unique story because people who made it out, survived, whatever the proper term is, all had an amazing story or they wouldn't. But that's the early part of the book, which I call Passages. And it's, and here by the way is the book. And it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's really, really a fascinating story. Um, it's, I think what you said, I think the way you described it, it was, this story was sort of the inspiration for the book. This is what kind of got you going to thinking, maybe you needed a, a memoir of your life, but it was the beginning of your life and, the, and your parents' story, which motivated you in the first place. And, right. believe, and if you would like a copy of it, Book Passage would be happy to send it to you and uh, check with us and, and you, you, you will really find it a great story. You, you uh, eventually ended up in New York um, and uh, grew up there as I uh, went to um, went to school in New York and went to Brandeis. And I think in your, I think you said in 1962, you took a trip during the summer down to Mississippi and that had a big impact on your life. And the reason I asked that is because I was growing up in the Bay Area in that time, a little bit older than you, but totally removed from any sense of what the civil rights movement was really going through down in the South. It was just sort of an abstract thing. And I don't know, maybe you had that feeling before you went to Mississippi that it wasn't really real to you, but apparently we, that the that experience you had in 1962 brought it all home. Would you like to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I I, I think it was I think it was you know it was an opportunity which I was given. I couldn't have appreciated at the time I was given it just how significant it was going to be. Um, there was a, a, a white Mississippi lawyer named Bill Higgs who was at Brandeis, and he invited three of us to go with him down to Mississippi. And we went down for an extended trip. It was 62, as you say, but it was just at the very beginning as the civil rights movement was taking off uh, in, in an organized way. Remember 56, 57, 58, there was the, the bus boycotts and so on. And in that period, we met literally everyone who was subsequently a major figure in the Mississippi civil rights story. Um, we met Fannie Lou Hamer, who was the leader of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. We met Edgar Evers, who was assassinated a year after we were there. Um, we met, and I'll tell you a bit about where I was, James Meredith, the first black student at, at Ole Miss. Um, and we were even invited to the home and spent a very, a very interesting evening with William Faulkner, who died six months later. Uh, what a thrill. What was significant about it for me were two things. One was I saw a degree of poverty and uh, the, the extent to which the, the livelihood of people in Mississippi was so very different from anything I had ever seen, Black lives in Mississippi. The degree of poverty, the degree of segregation made a profound impression on me um, because I was impressionable. I was a you know, college student. The other thing that happened that was kind of amazing was that when we met James Meredith, I said afterwards, you know, Mr. Meredith or James, whoever I called him, I said, do me a favor, write me a long letter about why you want to go to Ole Miss, why you want to take this risk, risking really your life. And he did. And then when he went to Ole Miss in the following fall, we, Brandeis, had an exclusive, world exclusive on James Meredith explains why he wants to go to, to, to Ole Miss. That was my first time I got into the New York Times in a little wire service story. And the truth is that kind of early experience motivates you in a way that you're probably gonna go there anyway. I mean, I was born to be an observer just in the nature of things. 
But that Mississippi experience was profound. And, and anybody, anybody who gets out of their normal space to do something like that is doing themselves a great service. I believe that for anybody who's a young teenager or student, going to a place that is not what they're from and understanding the differences in the way it works and the culture and so on is a, is a very important. I, I always say that the greatest experiences for me in college were <clears throat> not in the classroom. So that gave you a taste for journalism. It sounds like that was, was that where you got the idea? You, you wanted to be a, a journalist? Well, I, I, you know, I probably always wanted to be a journalist. I just didn't know what it was called. Journalist, it sounds very pompous. Um, I kind of, <laughs> I knew that I liked watching and observing, and uh, my father was an assiduous reader of, of, my father was not the kind of guy who said, let's go out in the back of the park and go out back, you know, backyard and throw a ball around. But he did read the New York Times every day, and therefore so did I. And um, so I started very early with an interest in the world around me. And I'm not sure, you know, none of us can really identify exactly the moment when something clicks in. But it was very clear to me from very early age that I liked watching the world um, unfold around me. And many experiences which other people might have ignored made a very strong impression. I mean, Mississippi being certainly one of them. Well, then, well, I guess it was, what, three years later, you, you took your first job with I.F. Stone, with the I.F. Stone Weekly. With, now, anyone who's my age would know what that is, I think. Uh, but people younger might not appreciate the impact that that, that small journal with a what, pub, uh, circulation to 70,000 or so, the impact yeah. it would have in, in thought circles. Could you describe a little bit how it worked? Yeah, I mean, it was, again, one of those um, unplanned but extraordinarily important experiences. I.F. Stone, Izzy Stone, as he was known, was not it was in the 50s, he was basically blacklisted. He, he was because he was considered leftist and couldn't really get a proper job, although he'd had it in the past. He was a very good journalist, was well known, but nobody wanted to hire him at that point. So he did what today people do, you know, much more than they did then. Started his own weekly um, called I Have Stones Weekly. The initial circulation was 5,000. And I've always liked to say that one of the first subscribers was Albert Einstein. And later, Marilyn Monroe was so impressed, she bought a copy for every member of Congress. But by the time I worked for him in the mid 60s, Izzy had become really very, very significant in the civil rights anti-war movement. And the reason is this, while he was racist, you know, became a leftist and, 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 but once he visited Moscow, he came back and he said, no, 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 these are bad people. But he didn't become an apostate. He didn't become an anti-communist. What he was, in the language of the 60s, he was what's known as a new leftist. He believed in, in, in social justice and civil rights and civil liberties. He was opposed to the Vietnam War, as so many young people were, which is why, even though he was then in his 50s, he had such an impact on, on people in my generation. Just to let you know that anybody who wants to know more about Izzy Stone is a wonderful documentary called I Have Stones Weekly, which you can get on YouTube. When it came out in 1973, Vincent Canby, the New York Times book critic, said it was one of the 10 best movies of the year, made him feel the way other people felt about the sound of music. And you can, anybody can watch it. It's a little 65 minute black and white movie. You wanna know what Izzy was? Actually, among other things, you'll see a cameo of me. So there you are as a very young man. <laughs> you know, it's, it's hard for me to find anything comparable today, or maybe you, have some thoughts about whether there's any any news service, any journalist that has the, the same kind of impact that he had during that period, or was well, it his, or was it just a something that only could have existed during the fifties and sixties? No, I don't think that's the case. Actually, you know, all these people writing on Substack, uh, you know, all these people who are setting off on their own to be independent journalists, and the okay. Substack is very significant example of that, people creating their own newsletters. It's just digital now. Then it was it was in print. I mean, Izzy would actually go with his wife and me and mail the weeklies <laughs> once a week. I think that there's a lot of independent voices. What he had, which is today something that people would recognize, he had a very distinctive voice in the way he wrote. It was never shrill. 
it was investigative. He was a brilliantly investigative reporter, finding all kinds of stuff that other people would have missed. And he did it with a voice of vigor and a certain degree of humor. And that I think is something that the best of the sort of independent people try to do today in some of the publications and some of the online publications. It's, a, it's, a, it's journalism with an attitude. But the thing about Izzy that made him, I thought, so extraordinary was he could do all that without being shrill and never made a mistake. I mean, my great fear as his assistant, because I wrote for him from time to time, was making a mistake. Izzy had never made a mistake. And, um, you know, he was extraordinary in the sense, you know what his last thing was? His last thing was when he start, finished the weekly, he taught himself a classic Greek and uh, wrote a book called The Trial of Socrates, which he was published just before he died and was a national bestseller. That was Izzy. Uh, he was a scholar in the old school and a radical in the best sense. That's great. So from there, you went to you went to work for the uh, Washington Post as a, as a, I believe, a foreign correspondent at that point. Well, uh, I had I had many many identities at the Post. I started as a you know I started I I, I really started there as a very very. I mean, after one year with Izzy, um, which is a logical, you know, natural tenure, um, I got hired curiously by the Post in London as the night cook and bottle washer, and it was then the London bureau, uh, and eventually became a local reporter. And then, uh, in 1970 uh, spring, Mr. Bradley, the editor, called me in and said, "Hey, young man, um, whatever you call, I don't think he called me young man. He certainly today he couldn't call me young, the young person." He said, are you interested? Would you go to Vietnam? And if Ben Bradley says he wants to send you to Vietnam, you don't say, let me call my broker or let me think about it. You go. So I went to Vietnam as a young journalist, a correspondent for the Post, and later went to Moscow and spent three very important years in my own career as a Moscow correspondent. Subsequently, I was in Washington as an editor, first on the foreign desk and national desk. And finally in London, and that was the point at which I realized that I had probably fulfilled my Washington Post plan. And I had met the chairman of Random House, Bob Bernstein uh, in Moscow. And, and he said before he left, he said, Peter, you realize that journalism is not a fit profession for a grown man. So if you get serious, call me. It took seven years, but I did call him. And so in, uh, in 1984, um, he, the Random House hired me and I went to New York as a senior editor. Well, before you give up your journalism career for our audience, there, there's a whole lot of stuff I want to cover there. <laughs> First of all, what was it like being a war correspondent in Vietnam? I mean, in the sense that how, how closely involved were you to the day-to-day -day activity there and how did that impact your the fact that you were on the scene, how did that impact your view of that war? Well, interestingly, if you, you know, start with the po point that I worked for IF Stone, uh, the Post, Mr. Bradley in particular, never said, are you, you know, do you have a strong view on the war? The assumption was as a journalist, as a reporter, I'm gonna go there and cover what I see. I'm gonna put my personal views aside. And I think that was the case. When I got there in late 1970, where, by the way, I met my wife, Susan, who was also there, and Catherine's mother, who Catherine being on this Zoom call, I hope, would attest to that. Um, we met in, in, a, in a war zone. But um, what it was by then was the, most of the, the American presence was significantly reduced by that point. It had been 500,000. It was probably down to 125 or 150,000 in the so-called Vietnamization. So what I was seeing then from 1970 until basically 1973, I was there for two years. What I saw was the end of the American period, what is called in Vietnam, the American War. And I saw and began and, and really was able to understand why this was a fruitless exercise, which now everybody recognizes because we just, we went into a society, into a country, protect, you know, to save democracy in a country that had no history of democracy, uh, people who didn't want us to be there. And we were totally ignorant. I mean, the great revelation of the Pentagon Papers was not this top secret. It was how so completely ignorant we were. We clutched around in Southeast Asia without knowing what we were doing. 
Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos. These were completely, you know, exotic, unknown places to us. And that's what I saw. And I was able to write about that in extensive. And then uh, after I became a publisher, I think my most significant Vietnam experience, and it really was, was the person as the editor uh, with Bob McNamara on the book called In Retrospect, in which he finally came to terms with the war. I mean, it was one of the most, probably the most controversial book I ever did. It's 25 years after the war and Bob McNamara said the war was wrong and terribly wrong and we owe it to future generations to explain why. So for me, what was really extraordinary was the ability, having been to Vietnam, having understood what I had seen in the war and had written about it, then to be with one of the great sort of architects of the war and getting him over time when I worked with him to recognize just how wrong it had been. And that was the book we published called In Retrospect. So my Vietnam arc was as a reporter, which I was then able to use as an editor and publisher. So I really came away with pretty much a you know 360 sense of, of the war. And I, you know, I think that one of the great statements about the war was made by uh, John Paul Van, Colonel John Paul Van, who was the subject of Neil Sheehan's famous Vietnam book, A Bright Shining Lie. And what John Paul Van said was that the United States didn't only have 10 years in Vietnam. We had one year 10 times. We didn't learn from our experience as we, and you know what? Iraq, Afghanistan, there's many cases in which this American, it, isn't, it doesn't start to be malevolent. We're not imperialists in the classic you know, sense of the European countries of the 19th century. We don't, we're, we're just, we're, we don't know quite how to do it. We don't do it well and we don't learn from experience. Because if we'd learned from experience, we wouldn't have been in Afghanistan for 20 years. I uh, have often thought that we should never engage in a war unless the majority of Americans can find that country on a map. But uh, so that, that, would, that would preclude most of our, most of our foreign adventures. The, um, from, okay, from Vietnam, you went to, uh, I guess that's when you went to the Soviet Union to cover to, right. as a correspondent there. Totally different experience. How would, what, how, what could you describe that, that, that period of time in, in well, Russia? The mid seventies in, in the history of the Soviet Union was in a sense, the, the moment of their maximum uh, impact on the world because it was post-World War II and they recovered from World War II. They were uh, seen as America's greatest uh, competitor threat. Um, so being a correspondent there meant that you really were looking at the place that mattered most uh, in policy terms and political terms in the United States. I would say, to, just to make it simple, in Vietnam, you were in a war zone. In Moscow, you were in a very authoritarian autocratic society in which they regarded journalists as people not to be trusted. So most of the time we were there, we were under very heavy surveillance and there was a lot of harassment and so on. But at the same time, we were able to penetrate the society. We had studied Russian, so we were able to communicate. Um, and the Washington Post was the kind of place that didn't make me you know, do a story every day on some minor development. So I was able, for example, to sit in a courtroom for several months and write a story about what it was like to steal a loaf of bread in, a, in an authoritarian society. What kind of trial would you get? Or we, one time we, we said, we're gonna to go to every night for two weeks, we're gonna to go to the theater and then write about what an average Russian Moscovite could see in the theater. So those were all the kinds of things that you could do as the kind of reporter I wanted to be. And it was completely fascinating. Um, both our kids were born while we were there. Um, and so we came as a couple, we left as a family. And the story there, again, subsequently, I was able to do a great many books based on my personal experience, but with authors of great sort of significant. I did two books with Boris Yeltsin. I did Sakharov. I did Anatoly Dobrynin, who was the Soviet ambassador in Washington for 30 years. Um, you know, I did Anatol Sharansky, who was a Natan Sharansky, who was a major dissident with whom I had a very close, ultimately very close relationship. 
So I was able to use the time I spent as a reporter subsequently as an editor and publisher. So all of that experience that I had had, I was able to put to professional use. That's fascinating. Did you, were you in a situation when you got to Random House where you could reach out to these people to see if they could do a book for you or did they come to you because they knew you were a sympathetic voice? Well, um, when I, when I got to Random House, which as I'm sure most folks know is a major, major, major place. Oh yeah. Very, very, very old school at the time. Very old school. It's a very different place now. Um, and I was an outsider. And while I had been hired by the chairman, um, and therefore I had a certain entree, I didn't know what I was supposed to do and he didn't tell me. So I sort of did everything until somebody told me to stop. And that was actually a very helpful thing to do because I learned how to be a publisher and editor essentially on the fly. And um, what happened was that I was there to do major nonfiction. Um, and which I did, um, some of which were just accidental, and accident, and accident was not the right word, but just happened because I was there. And some were, as you suggest, Bill, people that I had known, like Sakharov or Sharansky. Um, but I ended up with thing, this is where the Jimmy Carter and the other presidents came in. I, I was a go-to person on a certain kind of book and because I had my journalism background, my reporting background, I didn't approach these things in a sort of traditionally editorial way, you know, changing adjectives and, and so forth. My goal always was to get the story, the story that would frame a book. And from the beginning, that was my objective. And I think ultimately why, to whatever extent it was, my success was that when I dealt with these authors, I was getting the story the story they wanted to tell, the story they needed to tell. And that was a very helpful way to publish books. Um, I had to learn how to, the difference between journalism and publishing is very simple. In journalism, you get the story, you write it and go home. In publishing, you get the story, it gets written, and then you have to go out and make people care about the story, buy the story. That's the, the bifurcation. One is editorial, the other is the traditional publishing role. And what I didn't know when I got there was how much I would enjoy the publishing role, that I liked the, the, the dissemination, the distrib distrib distribution of books. Random House right now, and I think probably for the long as we've been in the business, has you know many different imprints, many different, uh, I, I hesitate to call them silos, but they, to a certain extent, I think they have function like independent operations. Mm -hmm. So do, when you were there, were you given the kind of independence to choose a book and put them, promote a book that you thought you needed? Or was this more of a company-wide decision on every book? No, no, no. I, um, again, it was a kind of weird circumstance in which when they hired me, they hired somebody who was, as I say, an outsider. And it was up to me. I, I say that jobs like that are 10% given and 90% taken. Um, I, when I got there, it was, you know, it was up to me to figure out what it was I was supposed to do. I eventually became publisher of one of the imprints, Times Books imprint, which had, the Random House had acquired from, from the New York Times Company. So I did have my own imprint uh, with a certain degree of independence on that score. The problem with the New York Times imprint was the real moneymaker at the New York Times was crossword puzzles. <laughs> and I... <laughs> I had to say that whatever the virtues of crossword puzzles are, I was not a fan particularly, but I became the world's leading publisher of crossword puzzles. But the problem was that that was, was necessary to do the kinds of books I really wanted to do. Um, and the kinds of books I really wanted to do were the books I've always done. They're serious nonfiction. And I had to recognize that in a place as, as formidable as Random House, there are tremendous commercial pressures. So what I needed to figure out was how I could do the kinds of books I wanted to do uh, within those commercial pressures. Um, and in the end, that's one of the reasons, I think the main reason why I left, because I, I left to say, I wanna go and start a company which publishes the kinds of books that I wanna publish, but without the constraints of commercial requirements that a great big publisher like Random House does. You cannot overstate the case to which Random House publishes magnificent books. <laughs> 
magnificent books, but so many books that the books that are not at the top of the list are always going to be slightly less visible. And so some of the books that I did there were very visible, extremely visible, so very large number of copies. And then a lot of them were less so. <laughs> and um, well, you can ask me about Donald Trump. I mean, everybody ultimately will say, how in God's name did you end up with Donald Trump? Well, you want to ask me? I'll tell you. Um, I want to ask you. I was going to uh, ask you. <laughs> well, I did how four, in God's name. <laughs> I did four presidents. Uh, two of whom were, were presidents that were presidents, and two of whom in a million years you wouldn't have guessed were going to become presidents. The two I did were Jimmy Carter and Bill Clinton. I did seven books with Jimmy Carter, including a book of poetry, <laughs> a children's book, and I had a wonderful time with Carter. I mean, I spent a lot of time with him in planes, sitting at his kitchen table with, with Rosalind. We'd say grace. I mean, it was really a relationship. Clinton, I did a, a 92 election book and 96 secret book about his 96 election policy plans, which we managed to keep secret. And when it was announced, everybody got very excited. I knew because I'd actually been involved with the book. It wasn't very interesting. But I did those two books with Clinton and got to see him close up. Trump, uh, what happened was I had just arrived at Random House and Cy Newhouse, the owner of the company, whose best friend, Roy Cohn, celebrated New York fixer, was a great admirer of mentor to Trump. And he said to Cy, Cy, this guy's a comer. It's, it's in, hard to believe, but the first story about Trump in the, Washington, in the New York Times was in 1976. And the, and the unforgettable sentence about it was that he looked like Robert Redford. So by the time I got involved, Trump was already a New York figure. And so I wanted to do the book and I was tasked to be the person to make it happen. Everybody now knows that there was a co-author named Tony Schwartz who has come to regret enormously that he was involved with it. Problem for Tony is he did a terrific job. Um, he really channeled Donald Trump in a way that is to this day, extraordinary. Summarize it very cl clearly. Donald Trump in the mid 70s, uh, I'm sorry, in the mid 80s, was already a notable figure in New York. Trump Tower, all that other business. He was the person then that he was all those years later when he became president, except he was a New York developer. Uh, there were certain you know, ticks. He lived over the store, he lived in an apartment above his office, like he did in the White House. He was disciplined enough never to smoke and never to drink. That's a fact. He was only interested, truly interested in what was good for him. But then, and that enabled him to be a success of a certain kind in New York real estate. Later, he was the president of the United States with many of the same attributes the thing to remember about Trump is when we published that book in 1980, it was, it was published at Christmas time, 87, and through the spring of 1988, it was a huge bestseller. So a million copies in the first three months before The Apprentice, just on the strength of the book and his reputation in New York. And the following year, for reasons that you know, very simple, but I went to a wrestling, professional wrestling match with my son, who was very briefly interested in it. And this was promoted by Trump. 18,000 people in the Atlantic City arena in 1988 or 89 at the latest. And when Trump walked in, those people went wild, cheering and clapping. And the fact is, that is his appeal. All those years later, the kinds of people who went to professional wrestling in the 80s were the kinds of people who wanted to see Donald Trump as president. Final point, in all those years, he was in real estate and construction and boxing and wrestling and beauty contests. No prosecutor was ever able to put a glove on him. And it's probably gonna to be tomorrow for the first time that there's a real indictment that, that is of a Trump himself entity. Trump organization and his chief financial officer. Remember, 
campaign manager went to prison, Manafort, personal lawyer went to prison, Cohen. Trump has always managed to navigate somehow and stay afloat. Four bankruptcies, two impeachments. He lost the election in 2016 and became president of the United States. That's the phenomenal and terrifying story of Donald Trump. And, you know, when people say, well, do you regret having been involved? No, it's a hell of a story. <laughs> did you, I, remember, uh, I didn't, did, I didn't. Did you publish, time. did you publish his second book? I did when it was called Surviving at the Top when he wasn't. And, and the, the end of that was on the day, I think you may have been there, Bill. This was the American Booksellers Association Convention in Las Vegas in 1990. Right. I was there, as a matter of fact. And he gave the big speech in the morning. Uh, to you know, thousands of booksellers and lots of cheering and all this. That morning, the Wall Street Journal had reported that he was $5 billion in debt, which $3 billion was personal. Well, the reason, the, I bring it up is, the reason I bring it up is he wanted to have an author event, a book passage, just like you're having one right now. Uh, yeah. This would have been a live event. He actually called the house. Uh, he personally called, talked to Elaine and said, how come you didn't ask put in a request to have an author of that with you. And Elaine, to her everlasting credit, said, basically, we don't want to, we don't want to have an event with you. And uh, he couldn't I, believe it. Understand, Bill, that that is one of the keys to Trump's enduring whatever it is, presence. When he was bankrupt, five billion in debt, he hired a guy who I had never heard of, a guy called Bolenbach, who came from one of the hotel companies, who was the chief financial officer. And that guy came in and in the space of 18 months, stabilized the Trump universe, sold the airline, sold the plaza, put him on a $400,000 a month <laughs> allowance. And when I asked Trump, I said, so Donald, where did you find this guy? See, I read about him and I read about him in Business Week. The thing about Trump is his universe is in his control. He's not as somebody who is, is able or willing or needs to be a, 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 a con conventional public figure of any yeah. kind. All well, about him. And it's he, all felt, about he, felt like he, he felt like he had a need to have, a, have an event at our store. We just, Elaine just well, wouldn't have it. Didn't want anything still, to do with the guy. But that's, but that's characteristic. You know how many authors would call the owner of a store? And, 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 <laughs> not very or, many. No, I mean, that would be typical. And he probably called a dozen of, you know, stores. I mean, he, or more than, a, and some would have him and some, you know, would not. Look, the fact is he's a remarkable figure and you cannot not be curious as to how he did it. And that's what you would. <laughs> yes, indeed. So yeah. at some point, not to get, to get off Mr. Trump here for a minute, yeah. Um, you decided to strike out on your own with your own company. I, I Public need to, affairs. I need to interrupt, Bill, because I also yeah. did Barack Obama's dreams for my father. Oh yeah, no, no, no. We don't want to forget that. Which, which offsets uh, the the fact of Donald Trump. Catherine, we, we, we had an event for for that book, and we loved it. Yeah, when my daughter says that when I get to the pearly gates, they're going to say Trump, and I'm going to say, "Yeah, Obama," and she's and, and they're going to send me to purgatory. The thing about the thing about Obama was that he had gotten a book contract from Simon & Schuster, missed his deadline, they canceled it. He came to me with a canceled book deal and the agent said, well, we, he needs $40,000 to pay back Simon & Schuster. And I met with him and we said, very interesting guy, published Dreams to My Father in 1995, it was respectably received, but it wasn't until 2004 when he gave the keynote speech at the Democratic convention and became a superstar that the same book, the exactly same book we published in 1995, sold 4 million copies. Yeah. The phenomenon of Barack Obama was that he wrote a book, which um, a century from now will be read as a classic of a young man who becomes president's really remarkable book. And he did it, I like that final publishing note. We paid him 40,000 when he and Michelle were selling their presidential memoirs, they got 65 million. I said, well, that is the biggest arc in the history of publishing. 40,000 from us, 65 million from Random Mass. Yeah. 
you uh, eventually you left Random House to set up your own publishing company. That's about the time I met you when you were uh, running public affairs. Um, tell us what, would you, what you had in mind, and, and it was a great company, and it, what, uh, what, what motivated you to do that, and what, was, what need were you trying to fill with that particular publishing house? Well, I came to feel that the kinds of books I wanted to do were important and interesting, but were for a finite audience. That partially, it was partly because of my experience, you know, having been involved with NPR and PBS over the years and knowing what that audience was, I figured that was my audience. So if there are 300 million, 320 million Americans, maybe 10% of them would ever buy one of my books, one of the books that I wanted to do. And therefore we had to have a company where the expectations in terms of it as a business were appropriate to what its potential sales were. In other words, we could not be Random House or Simon & Schuster throwing money around. We had to do good books in a way that would be supportive, you know, that, that you could sell enough copies to pay the rent. As I said at the outset or before, it's a business publishing. You get a story and then you have to sell a story and the story has to pay the rent. And so Public Affairs was conceived uh, on that model, that we'll publish books of consequence. We're gonna do it by keeping um, a very close eye on both our expectations and our revenues. And therefore we will publish good books as long as we can. We will not publish the you know, sort of superstar books. Although in the end we did. I mean, you know, we ended up publishing every book by George Soros, or, you know, Vernon Jordan who came to us and published a bestseller by him. We've had a number of bestsellers. Uh, we published two Nobel Prize books, one by Muhammad Yunus, Micro Lending, another by the Banerjee and Duflo won the Economics Prize. We were able to get very good books, but never went to bed thinking we'd overpaid. That, that I mean, for anybody who cares about publishing, that's really important to be able to do that. And you need a certain kind of staff, which is mission driven. Um, I always used to say that we were, we were not a for-profit or a non-profit, we were a seeking profit. And mercifully, I had the kind of investors that understood that. Uh, and I was one of them, I, I was actually the largest investor. I, I said that if you're going into this business with the expectation that you're going to leave it you know, very rich, then find something else to do. The point here was to publish books of consequence, which we have. I mean, public affairs is now 24 years old. That's, you know, for a startup from scratch, that's extraordinary. It's now owned by Hachette, which is one of the big publishing companies. And Hachette has owned us now, owned public affairs for five years and treated it well. Uh, I say that their greatest gift to us was to treat public affairs with respect. Nobody lost their jobs. They didn't change the business model. And the only reason is that we publish good books and pay the rent. Uh, you cannot expect to have somebody let you do what you want to do unless you meet the minimal expectations for revenue. Uh, that's where editorial work, journalism, publishing, marketing intersect. Having a vision, executing the vision in a way that enables you to run a business. When you talk about controlling your costs, are you mostly talking about controlling the, the size of the advances you would give authors? Is that the key thing to, to, to doing the kind of thing you wanted to do with public affairs? Yeah. I mean, I think advances is certainly a major part of it. Uh, you know, you read all the time about these, you know, multi-million dollar advances. Well, that was something we would never conceive of. Uh, here's a slightly technical way of describing it. If an author gets a, what they call a six figure advance, which is the traditional sense of, wow, that's quite a lot of money, six figures, right? Well, the way I calculated it, if you pay an agent 15% and you pay your taxes, the $100,000 is now $60,000. And if you're working on it for a year, it's not all that much money. On the other hand, the publisher has actually given you $100,000. Mm -hmm. 
the publisher is carrying $100,000 on its balance sheet and you're only getting 60. That didn't make sense to me. You have to come up with a way that an author understands that you cannot support your book just on the advance. There must be other ways to do it. Um, and that was always one of the things that drove our, our approach to the business, which was we can get good books as long as people understand that you're not going to go off and spend five years on a huge advance. Uh, the other thing that's important to know is that stores like Book Passage were absolutely crucial. You had to have a relationship with the independent stores in particular where customers would care about our kinds of books. So Bill, as you know, I made a point of getting to know you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, hey, and, and wanting to. I'm and glad you, know, you did. <laughs> and thoroughly and completely enjoying it. I understood that the independent bookstore was the mainstay of the kinds of books that I wanted to do. And the bookstores like Book Passage, are, they're a huge community asset. People who live in Marin or live in San Francisco think of themselves as Book Passage customers in the way they think of themselves as NPR listeners or New Yorker readers or whatever other ways they identify with in their sort of spiritual or intellectual lives. I'm going to get you on every day to repeat that. I love well, it. in fact, <laughs> it, has the, it has the distinct virtue, Bill, of being true. I mean, I, ah. and I, and I've, I've been around long enough to know that the great bookstores in this country really are much more than bookstores. They really are community assets. And the, all people who own them recognize that. And you go into Book Passage and you want a cup of coffee and you want to see what they have and you want to go to an event or whatever. And that's very important. And that's something that books... Um, and one other last point on that. Everybody thought that the ebook was going to take over the business and that we were all going to end up looking at screens all the time. Truth is, three quarters of books are still sold and they're selling well in print. And about 10 for 15, 20% at the most are digital and about 10% are now audio. The thing to remember is that in today's world, a consumer has choices. You can buy a book in the format you want. And if you want it right away, you download it. If you're willing to look for it or wait for it and they don't have it in the store, you can get it in print or you can listen to it. And an awful lot of people do. So what's happened is what's made the book business, I think, much more stable than many of the other entertainment information businesses is we never had advertising, so we didn't lose it. And our audiences were really, and our customers were, were, were devoted to our kinds of books. And you know whether that is a huge bestseller or any of the other kinds of books that these days are at the top of the bestseller list or our kinds of books, which hopefully have a lasting value um, and important subjects. And, you know, I think it, it's not as gooey as it all sounds, Bill. I mean, it's a business. <laughs> One of the no, things it's, that a, it's, a, it's, it's definitely a business. And I, uh, everything you say there is absolutely true. It's um, um, the interplay between publishers and publishers like you who do serious books and a bookstore is crucial. Uh, we, um, as much as it's important to you to get your books out to uh, to stores for people to see, it's important for us to have a you know a selection that has selection of serious books, so that you know something there for for everyone who walks in the door and one book leads to another. You walk up to the shelf looking for a particular book and you see something to the left or to the right, and that becomes something that uh, you start browsing in, and pretty soon you've 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 uh, found something else you want. And this is something that no other medium has really been able to do really uh, uh, to that extent. You say that we, we've been in the business, the book business 40, 45 years. And during that time, there's everything's come along saying, well, this is gonna replace books. I remember when CD-ROMs were going to replace books. But when you look back, I mean, books have been there ever since Gutenberg and they're probably gonna be there for the for the long haul because there's something about holding a book and reading a book that has a certain uh, appeal to many people. These other ways of looking at a book are important, 
but the basic book uh, is something you want to hold. And if it's something you really, that gives you some real satisfaction, you'll want to hold on to it for a long time. Absolutely. There are two, I always, the joke I always re repeat is that the first book in print was Gutenberg's Bible. And the second book in print was called Publishing is Dead. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm predicting it for 500 years. The other thing is, and this is the sort of the aphorism that drives my sense of books now, which is good books any way you want them now. That's the reality. Whereas in the past, you might go in the store and you do, you know, you have Bill's book and well, we're out of stock and we'll get it for you in a week or so. Today, people no longer think of getting a book as a, an obstacle to be overcome. There's a belief that you can get the book if you want it one way or another. And that has changed the book market. Yeah. That has made people feel less like it's something I have to do. I, you know, the, in, in Russia, there was always a difference between the verb to buy or to obtain. And in the old days, many people thought, well, books, I have to obtain the book. Now you can buy it and choose to buy it in whatever format. And I think that was the amazing thing which almost no one really could have predicted in quite the way it's turned out. And another last point about this is, you know, is the resilience of analog. When, I, when, I, when I'm told over and over again by how many people now listen to podcasts, I'm always reminded of the fact that podcasts are after all radio. And what is radio? Radio is the oldest form of broadcast. And it's still very popular, particularly among young people. And why is it? Because it's portable. And what is it about books that you hold them in your hand and you put them on your shelf, you, you have a personal relationship with a book. And I think that's one of the reasons why books have been so very stable and successful in the very disruptive age of the, of the digital change. <laughs> that's interesting. You talk about putting books on shelves. How many times do you walk into someone's home for the first time and you look around what I instinctively look around for is the bookshelves to see what right. books they have. You know, they don't have any books on display in the, in the living room or anywhere on the main floor of the house. I think, wait a minute, <laughs> what am I doing here? Well, and, and you know, you'll notice that in, in most of the Zoom things that has happened, you know, in the phenomenon of the last 18 months, so more or less, people like to be photographed in front of a bookshelf when they're on the Zoom, right? And it's become a kind of a joke. You know, how many people have Robert Caro on the shelf right behind them? <laughs> uh, I would be in front of a bookshelf, but we couldn't figure out how quite to get the Right, right. When we, when, we, when we first started this, before we went live, you were in front of a bookshelf, but the, but the lighting wasn't good. So we moved. Yeah, I want you to know that we have lots and lots of books. Lots of books. <laughs> yeah, I, got, I have lots of books here. This is the only one I'm holding right now, but. If you span the camera out, you'd see nothing but books all over. And by the way, before I forget it, I really want to put in a, a plug for your son's writing, Evan Osnos. In case, for those of you who don't recognize the connection of the name, uh, Peter's son, Evan, is a terrific writer, a staff writer for The New Yorker, uh, won the, was the National Book Award, I think, for his book about China, and has written a biography of uh, Joe Biden. So, and he's uh, got a book coming out in the fall uh, called Wildland, which is going to be published in September, which, I, you know, I've read, of course, and is brilliant. It's a book in which takes the three places that he knows best in this country. One was where he grew up in Greenwich, Connecticut. Another was Southside Chicago, where his, wife, my, his mother's family is from and where he was a young reporter. And the third is Appalachia. And he uses those three places, digs really deeply into those three places to explain what is what what is it that brought us to the point we are in this country now. It's 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 narrative. It's it's very colorful. It's full of people. It's a real book that gives us a sense of things. I mean, that's because he's a New Yorker kind of writer. That's what he does. Most recently, last week, he did a very long, very good profile of Joe Manchin. That's what Ep does. And the Biden book. This is an interesting fact. Biden book was a huge bestseller in Albania and Lithuania and all over the world. American it took some time before they were interested in Biden. They kind of had to come to it and recognize just what a significant fact Joe Biden is in our 
contemporary lives. So if you haven't read the Biden book, do. If you want to read Wildland, that's coming in September. And the Osnos family will be very happy. <laughs> I'm, uh, and I'm sure our events director is on the phone right now to New York to try and line up an event with, with, with Evan. Um, we, uh, we, we'd be very much looking forward. Matter of fact, when I first met him, it was when you, the two of you walked into books, walked into the book passage a couple of years ago. Uh, it was the first time I ever met him. And it's uh, been, a, been a pleasure to, to know both of you ever since. Thank you. Um, you're now, you've now started yet another publishing venture, <laughs> which uh, Platform Press, which is, uh, which has published your book. Uh, and I think you have another one coming with, um, what's your next book coming out? Well, what we did was, just so understood, when I finished this book, I, is it, I'm, it's very dark here now. I can turn a light on if you want, or if you're okay with the dark. Oh, you look good. It's just sort right, of... Uh, right. Um, an evening, so evening, in fact. We're in the barn. So um, the, when I finished the book and needed to figure, I never, when I was writing it, I never said to anybody what I thought I would do with it. Because you're not really sure. A memoir, friends and family, what is it going to be? And when I finished the book and thought that it was more than just, the, you know, friends and family, uh, I also knew that <laughs> I knew too much about publishing to get an agent and have it sent around to a bunch of places and God forbid be in an auction and so on. So my wife and I set up a publishing company and called Public Platform Books. And what we did, and this is the essence of it, is we did what people tend to do in movies and theater. You put together teams for a project as opposed to a permanent staff and so on. So these are all people who I knew had worked with in the past editors, designers, sales and distribution people were all people I knew, but they were doing this book for us. And we always said that we would do other projects and we've got another one coming next spring, which we're doing in partnership with the Harvard Business Review Press. It's called George Soros, A Life in Full. And what it is is the people who really are the most expert in all the different ways George Soros has made an impact in the world, finance, philanthropy, politics, no one person can really write a full comprehensive biography of somebody as complicated as Soros. So we got these people who are really expert and that book comes out next March. And a couple of other things are in the works. It's, this is, not, you, know, you know what an encore is? An encore is after the main show, you come out and do an encore. And Platform Books is, is our, a bit of our encore. Well, this is the stage where you can, uh, can, can bring your encore performance anytime. So I think it's probably time to wind things up here and thank you very much. Let people know you can get a copy of especially good, especially good view, <laughs> which is a, an especially good title for Peter's book. Get a copy of all of Evan's books uh, and probably a copy of all of the books you've ever, most of them are probably still in print, all of the ones you've ever worked on over the years. My God, what a list. Thank Again, you. thank you very, very much, and we'll be uh, in touch.